Hi, this is Eric Prostowski, and welcome to another session of EP on EP. It's an absolute delight to have with me today Dr. Vivek Reddy, who's the Helmsley Trust Professor of Medicine at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and has just participated in a uh, session of late-breaking trials at the 2019 uh, Heart Rhythm Society meetings on pulse field ablation. Mm -hmm. So, some of our listening audience may not even know what that is, Vivek, so can you give us like a background before you go into the trial? Sure, Eric. So first of all, thanks for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Um, so pulse field ablation is a new technology, and it's an old technology. It's basically, instead of using thermal ablation, whether heating tissue or cooling tissue, the idea of pulse field is to apply electric fields across the tissue to basically punch holes in membranes. The mechanism of destruction is electroporation. Now, as you remember, this is how ablation was done in the past, DC That's shots. That's how it started. That's how yeah. it started. But the problem with that is you're well aware it was uncontrolled, there was barrel trauma, a number of other issues. And of course, it, what fell by the wayside with the advent of radio frequency ablation. But it's come back now because of investigators like Fred Whitcamp and others who've done some really nice work showing that this can be done in a very controlled way. And importantly, has some, has some advantages, both in terms of time, because ablation takes that long, but also, and most importantly, because there is some degree of tissue selectivity. It turns out that myocardial tissue has greater sensitivity to pulse fields than other tissues, such as the esophagus, nerves, etc. So you can work in that uh, difference between where myocardial sensitivity is and other tissue sensitivity, and work here to get destruction of myocardium, but not the other tissue, at least that's in theory. Um, we and others have done a lot of work in preclinical work, that is, in terms of trying to uh, characterize this in animal models, and the data has been favorable. And based on this, last year this time, as you know, we presented our initial data. It was work that I did with my colleague Peter Nuzzo and with uh, Pierre Jay in Bordeaux, where we had patients who had paroxysmal AFib. We had a catheter that was a, it was a one-shot type of technology. It was a basket-type catheter. We put in the pulmonary veins in 15 patients with paroxysmal AFib and applied the, the pulse field shocks. And actually, it was, it was, there were monophasic pulse field um, energy uh, deployments. And what we showed was very good pulmonary vein isolation, acute pulmonary vein isolation, and no problems. Again, 15 patients. That was last year. Since then, over the course of two different uh, studies, uh, 81 patients we've treated total in this time period uh, using both the initial waveform as well as newer waveforms, biphasic and various alterations in the waveform. And what we we're now presented was the data both in terms of the chronic safety and importantly, durability of isolation. So let me stop you there. In the earlier ones you did, mm -hmm. was it durability? So in the, in the earliest data, or the last year's data, we didn't have any durability information okay. because all we had at that time was we had treated these patients, they were doing well, and we had acute isolation that was very quick. So you didn't actually go back in and take a look? We actually did later, okay. and that those initial 15 patients are actually part of, to, of, okay. of what, uh, what we presented. That's so right. can you go through uh, your presentation here? And then I have a question I want to ask you afterwards, which is, there's so many questions I have about this technology. Yeah. The depth of it is atrial yeah. tissue, the same sensitivity as ventricular, because obviously, you know, people are going to be thinking three steps ahead of your study. Yeah, right? yeah. So tell us what you presented here at the meeting. Sure. So uh, over the course of these two trials, we had 81 patients. Uh, these uh, these studies were conducted in Prague in the Czech Republic with my colleague Peter Nuzzo, as well as in Bordeaux with uh, Pierre J and his colleague Hubert Cochet. And we, we had about four different buckets of Let's, we'll call them buckets of waveforms that we had used. There was the initial waveform and the subsequent bipolar waveforms. Okay. In the initial group of 15 patients, when we remapped those patients, we, our isolation rate on a per vein basis was only about 40%, and our per patient basis was only about uh, 15, 20%, meaning that the majority of patients had at least one vein reconnect. Okay. Okay. So the waveform has evolved, and a couple things happened. One, acutely, by going from monophasic to biphasic, we no longer have the musc muscular stimulation that is, you know, from DC shots. Right. Now we can actually do the procedures not under general anesthesia but under sedation. Okay. Like all the cases except for the first one was under sedation. Okay. Number two, may I stop you yeah. say? So if it's so selective to tissue type, yeah. Why did the initial one cause uh, the the muscle diaphragm? And wasn't that well, more yeah. nerves? Yeah, that, but that's stimulation as opposed to destruction. Okay. So there oh, is a okay. difference. Okay. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Go ahead. So. Um, now, with it, the, so that's the first thing. And then the procedure times and the procedure performance went really well. We had no problems there. 
Now, the, um, the durability data, which is our primary uh, interest, was, it was quite remarkable. Over the course of these uh, of this void form, um, uh, we'll call it evolvement, evolvement um, we, had, we saw an increase in the durability such that the most recent waveform that we used, the most number of patients got remapped, 18 patients. Uh, we had 100% isolation. At what, three months? At three months. 100%? 100%, you know, not, we, I've I worked with a lot of different that. technologies. Yeah. I've never seen 100%. We've yeah. had 90%, you know, 85%, never 100%. So, okay. so it was pretty remarkable. So is it a, any change in the delivery catheter or is it only the waveform? Uh, every, so the, the catheter did change a little bit in terms of how we deployed it. Um, the catheter can take this sort of a basket configuration or get squished further into what we call a flower petal configuration. Yes, so we had both sort of patterns and we yeah. ended up using more basket, or actually a combination of basket and flower in the subsequent uh, and waveform. regardless of that that you still had isolation yes and, and then in addition there was evolution of the waveform now the so that was on the efficacy side we were really happy now of course efficacy is, means nothing without safety right so there are a number of safety things that we had to look at now first let me tell you the bad news we had one patient out of the 81 that had uh, that developed pericardial effusion during the procedure and this was clearly related to catheter manipulation it was a case where Manipulation toward the right inferior vein. It was just an unusual anatomy and whatever we had a perforation. Per, yeah, we had a perforation okay. and the patient was tapped and pericardial synthesis and ultimately that's, that's really that's not that can happen with any cath. I was gonna say that's really not that's, the waveform. That's no, a technical thing. That's right. Gotcha. Now let's talk about the stuff that we really care about. Number one, phrenic nerve. So during the, the procedure you do see phrenic nerve stimulation meaning contraction of the diaphragm. Okay, but at the, at, at the end of the procedure and in the patient that came back for remap, we assessed the phrenic nerve in all patients, zero phrenic nerve palsy wow. or even paralysis. Okay. okay. So you can activate it but not destroy it. That's right. Go ahead. And this is completely consistent with the preclinical data. Yeah. Okay. But we even have histology. Okay. Uh, number two, uh, the esophagus. That's obviously one that we always worry about. And we have two sets of really important information. One, we did endoscopies, EGDs, okay. in um, about 25 or 28 patients. Okay. And we saw nothing. Well, so everything looks very good. Impressive. But even more impressive is uh, in a very small subset, eight patients, we did MRIs on the same day of the procedure. Actually, Hubert Cochet did all these. Uh, beautiful images. What you see is damage whitening both by delayed enhancement and by looking at um, uh, T2 edema imaging, you see the damage to the, to the myocardium, transmural damage, but the adjacent, myocardium, the adjacent esophagus, zero damage. I mean, you, you don't incredible. see it, but it's really incredible. Yeah. Um, so that's the esophagus. We also looked at uh, pulmonary veins. Um, so in a subset of the patients, no uh, 20 some patients, no evidence of stenosis, not even narrowing. You know, there's no alteration in the morphology. It looks just as if we never did any ablation there. It was really beautiful. And then, um, uh, let's see, what other complications can occur? Well, we lots of oh, stroke. one more, yeah, stroke. So we had no clinical uh, strokes, of course. Okay. Um, did you do we, MRIs? We did in 13 patients, probably not the best number, but we did in 13 patients, <laughs> we did uh, brain MRIs, both yeah. um, DWI and flare imaging, yeah. and we saw nothing. Well, that's okay. more. Now, I do obviously wanna, wanna caution, these are still relatively small numbers of patients. Right two centers. Uh, I think the durability data is extremely strong, but the safety data, we need to obviously get a lot yeah. more information. Well, but the, the key is though, this is this could be one of the true game changers. I agree. You know, um, This is really uh, I, interesting. We've all been waiting for, you know, what is the thing that will really make a difference, right? Yeah. I mean, if you can really get, here's what I'm interested in seeing. Yeah. If you really have durable PBIs, mm -hmm. okay? Because right. I've never been a person, as you know, that was totally convinced that that's the only place AFib could mm -hmm. come from. Mm -hmm. But if you really get tur durable PBIs, but I'm then very curious the, to see what yeah. the percentage recurrence is. Yeah, I think that's right? a great question. That, so. That's something I think we all want to see. Well, thank you. Boy, great job as always. Thanks okay. for, for pushing the field forward. And uh, we look forward to the second stage of this, which, uh, and then when you've figured it all out, I assume you'll come over to our place and give us a few catheters and we can get started. <laughs> I think actually uh, the IDE will hopefully start next year. Sounds great. Thanks, Vivek, as always. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thanks.